Theatre's role was made increasingly uncertain by the changing balance of power in Greece. By the mid-4th century, after years of conflict, the richest and most powerful figure in the Greek world was not a democrat, but a king, Philip II of Macedon. At the site of the Macedonian royal tombs at Agai, archaeologists have discovered an extraordinary array of treasures testifying to the wealth and might of Philip's kingdom. Philip created a strong army and made canny alliances. He brought the best craftsmen to his kingdom and secured the greatest thinker of the age, Aristotle, as tutor for his son Alexander, the boy who would later become Alexander the Great. It's one of the more unfair characterizations of ancient history that Macedon was some kind of savage and uncultured place. Far from it, it was a hive of creativity and high culture. Not just in terms of using precious metals for vessels or creating extraordinary armor, but also in terms of the theater. Philip brought dramatists from across Greece to compete in his own dramatic competitions. Poets followed him in his campaigns, and actors came to live, work, and reside in Macedon. Neoptolemus sold his place in Athens and moved north. And Philip used all of this as a crucial part of his campaign for political and cultural supremacy. Well, he was the super patron. He was the Louis XIV of the day. And so if you wanted to get the best space, the best support, the biggest fees, uh, and you are now becoming more professional. So actors move. They don't just perform as citizens in their own city. So Philip is there. It all comes together. He accelerates the process. Actors become far, far more important. They knew all these stories off by heart. And we get superbly rich and famous actors like Neoptolemus or Theodorus, who's the Laurence Olivier of antiquity and <laughs> fantastically rich. Philip II certainly invited uh, famous actors to his court. He got famous actors going That's on diplomatic nice. missions yeah. for him. Um, and he tried to use theatre one way or another to help um, affirm his, his power. Philip understood that having the best plays and performers would enhance his own greatness. He also understood that kingship is itself a form of theatre. And in befriending famous actors like Neoptolemus, he ensured that positive reports about his regime found their way back to Athens and into the political debates taking place on the Pnyx. It was here in the assembly that the Athenians debated the growing threat from Macedon and tried to decide whether Philip should be considered friend or foe. Heading the pro-Philip faction was an actor turned politician called Eschines. Arguing against him was the politician and orator Demosthenes who believed Athens had to oppose Philip if necessary by force. Here, on the Pnyx, time and time again, Demosthenes and Eschines clashed over the Philip question. Demosthenes' argument was that Eschines had effectively taken bribes to work in the king's interest and not in those of his home city. But what's really interesting is the language he uses to make his case. He refers to Eschines as Hippocrates, the Greek word for an actor. You, Eschines, are a Hippocrates, a bit player of parts while I am the one sitting in the audience. You always serve our enemies' interests in politics, I, those of our country. The Greek word for actor, Hippocrates, is the root for our word hypocrite. So where did this uncertainty come from? Well, as Greece became more and more dominated by rich, powerful leaders, so the corrupting force of money and the fear of the corrupting force of money increased. Actors were, at the end of the day, like mercenary soldiers. They sold their services to the highest bidder. And more importantly, they had the ability to imitate and to deceive. So what everyone was worried about was that Philip was writing his own play and getting the public figures of Athens to star in it as his key actors. It was only a matter of time before Athens would have to decide one way or the other. In 338 BC, Demosthenes persuaded the assembly to vote in favour of meeting Philip in battle. This battle, Demosthenes versus Philip, Democrats versus Kings, would determine the future of Greece and the fortunes of theatre. 
Philip amassed his forces here in the plains of Chironea, right at the heart of the dancing floor of Ares. The king himself led his army, and leading the cavalry, his son Alexander, who would become Alexander the Great, then just 18 years old. And facing up against them, the combined forces of Athens and Thebes, and in the Athenian ranks, the orator Demosthenes. Philip was victorious, while Demosthenes, whose words had so inflamed the conflict, is said to have fled the scene. Two monuments to the battle remain visible to this day. They stand for more than just the graves of the fallen. They stand for the end of the independent and free politics of Greek city-states. Beneath these trees lie the ashes of Philip's fallen warriors. Their bodies were burned on a grand funeral pyre decorated with weapons before being buried beneath a huge mound of earth. The second monument to the battle sits beside the modern town of Chironea. This is the lion at Chironea proudly facing the battlefield. Its origins are somewhat mysterious, but what's really crucial is what's underneath it. 254 skeletons laid out in seven rows, a mass grave belonging to, we think, members of the Theban sacred band who fell in the battle. And their skeletons testify to the ferocity of the clash, leg bones broken in two, skulls fractured. And today the Greeks, as they do with all cemeteries, have lined it with cypress trees, forever marking the sanctity and importance of this place. I defy anyone to come here and not feel the importance of this place, this place where the fortunes of Greece changed forever. The world that had given birth to theatre was no longer governed by city-states or democrats. It was a world controlled by a king. But the story of the relationship between history and theatre would take a shocking and dramatic twist. Tragedy and real life were about to clash 